Hello, welcome to Communication 24-7's Virtual Classroom. I'm Jen Furlong, also known as Professor Speech Lady. Today's lesson focuses on the communication process. It's a very basic lesson in communication, but it is also perhaps the most important lesson in communication. And the reason being is because it serves as the foundation, understanding how the communication process works and how to apply it to everyday situations. That serves as the foundation from which we build all of our other communication skills. Um, so it's very important whether you're looking to improve your professional communication skills or your personal communication skills. This is where we need to get started. So let's go. Lesson one, the communication process. What is the goal of communication? Some will say that the point of communication is to inform or to persuade. Others will say that the point of communication is to educate. And still others will say that the point of communication is to inspire. Although all of these answers do sound like great goals, they aren't really the goal of communication. The goals I just mentioned are actually byproducts of effective communication. The actual goal of communication is really quite simple. It's to create a shared meaning. In order to accomplish this, we have to make sure that whatever message we're sending is in fact the message that's received. Ever hear of something being lost in translation? Well, by understanding the basic fundamentals of the communication process, you'll be better equipped to avoid that problem before it happens. Today, we're focusing on those actions that make up the communication process and how we can apply those actions to improve our communication skills. Merriam-Webster defines the word process as a series of actions that produce something or that lead to a particular result. Since communication is a process, we're going to take a look at the series of actions that make up the process and how those actions can lead to effective or ineffective communication. There are seven major elements or actions that occur throughout the communication process. These actions don't necessarily follow after one another step by step, like some type of recipe for baking a cake. Rather, they are all interacting with one another simultaneously. And just like any system that's made up of multiple parts, if you make the slightest change in one part, it will impact the entire system. Learning how these different elements affect one another and ultimately how even making slight changes to these elements can impact the entire communication process is the key to becoming an effective communicator. Any communication is going to start with the basic three elements of communication, the sender, the message, and the receiver. And for those of you who are saying, nuh-uh, that's not true, what about when I talk to myself? Well, in that case, you are the sender and the receiver. The same concept still applies. In a nutshell, person A has to figure out a way to send information to person B. For example, in recording this information for you, I had to figure out a few things first, like do I record it in English? Do I use slang? Should I cuss? These are examples of me figuring out how to encode the message. Alternately, the person receiving this message, and in this case, that's you, you have to interpret the message or decode it in order to understand it. This is the first lesson in using the communication process. As a speaker, I have to make sure I'm encoding the message in a way that the listener will decode it in the way I meant it. In other words, the message you send may not be the message that's received. You see, everybody's different. We all come from different backgrounds, different experiences, different educations, different cultures, etc., etc., etc. So it's my job as the speaker or as the sender of the message to make sure I can anticipate how you, the listener, the recipient, will decode my message. This is one way to avoid those embarrassing oopsie moments. You know those times when you say, but I didn't mean it that way. 
Well, in all honesty, it doesn't matter if you meant it that way or not, because that's the way it was interpreted. That was the way it was decoded. In order to become a great communicator, you have to take the listener's viewpoint into account and adjust the message accordingly. This brings us to the fourth element of the communication process, the channel. There are many different channels through which we send our messages to others. For example, have you ever had an interaction with another person without even saying a word? Perhaps you made eye contact, made a certain facial expression, threw in some hand gestures, and that was it for the conversation? Sending messages visually is a huge part of communicating with others. If someone asks you if you're all right, it's likely because of the visual messages that you're not even aware of sending. You know, they're decoding that sour puss face of yours and that hunched over body posture and those crossed arms to mean that you must be pissed about something. Other channels through which we send messages are through sounds, also known as the auditory channel, as well as through the technology channel. Now sounds don't only mean the words you are saying that they can hear. Sounds also include the nonverbal aspect of speech, like the tone of your voice, the volume, the pitch, rate of speech, etc. We can change the meaning of a very simple sentence just by changing the vocal variety of our voice. For example, listen to these sentences. She didn't want to know the answer. 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 Every single one of those sentences contain the exact same words, but each sentence contains a different meaning solely based on the tone that is sent through the auditory channel. Now the last channel, technology, has had a profound impact on the communication process. We have instant access to pretty much everyone. And just as with the other channels, this channel also can impact how the message is received. Usually, the more important the message, the more personal the channel of communication. For example, it's not a good idea to announce a life-changing event to your most intimate and important family members over social media. Trust me when I say the kids will not appreciate finding out about the divorce over Facebook. Trust me when I say the boyfriend will not appreciate finding out that you're pregnant over Twitter. Again, effective communicators take the channel through which they are sending their messages into account and they think about how that channel will impact how the message is received. The fifth element of the communication process is feedback. Feedback is the information that is sent from the listener back to the sender and can be intentional or unintentional. Usually the feedback is nonverbal. For example, while you're talking, the person you're talking to might yawn. You have to figure out the meaning behind that yawn. Is that person bored or is he just simply tired? Just as the receiver of your message has to properly decode that message in order to understand it, you have to properly decode the feedback to understand what to do next. If you think they're yawning because they're bored, then you know you have to change something up. Either make the message a little more exciting or do a better job at relating that message to that person. Help them understand why they need to pay attention to the message. Um, if you decide that they're yawning because they're just tired, you might decide to postpone the conversation to a later time when they're better rested. These are just five of the seven elements of communication, and you can already see how understanding each one of these elements can help you improve your communication skills. We'll take a look at the sixth element on the next slide. This brings us to the sixth element of the communication process, the environment. Not many people realize the impact that the environment has on the communication process. When I say environment, I literally mean the environment. It's pretty much everything that surrounds us. It's the tangible stuff like the physical location, how the furniture is set up, the size of the room. Think about your home for a minute. Specifically think about the eating area. Where do you have dinner? 
Does your family eat dinner together at a table that's small or large? Is it round or is it rectangle? What if you were to change the shape and the size of that table? How would it impact the communication during dinner time if you were to do that? Or if you eat dinner in front of the television, how does that impact the dinner conversation? What if you were to turn the television off? Would dinner time suddenly turn to anarchy and chaos? What about the living room? Do you have chairs that face each other? Or does all the furniture point toward the television? Do you think that setup impacts the communication between people when sitting in that room? The environment is also the intangible stuff, like how hot or cold the room is, or even the time of day. Imagine sitting in a classroom that is hot and it's stuffy and you're sitting there for an hour while listening to the teacher lecture. How would that experience be different if the classroom's temperature was actually comfortable and it was cozy? What about if it was cold? Would the temperature impact your ability to pay attention? Sure it would, most likely. The same goes for the time of day. Think back to your most recent argument or conflict. What time of day did it occur? If it was late at night, say going on two or three in the morning, it's likely that neither one of you were able to have a rational discussion just due to the stress and the exhaustion. Are you more alert and better able to listen and pay attention in the morning? Or is it better in the afternoon? The time of day definitely impacts the quality of our communication and our ability to handle conflict. Sometimes it just isn't the right time to have that conversation. Additionally, culture is a part of the environment. Think about what your culture has taught you about communication. For example, is it appropriate to interrupt a speaker who is presenting a speech to a large audience? Do you speak the same way in church that you do when you're out at the bar? Do you speak to your grandparents the same way you speak to your friends? These are all examples of the expectations that are set by the culture we live in. In our American culture, we expect you to have strong eye contact when communicating because it's an indication that you're being honest or at least that you're paying attention. On the other hand, there are other cultures that see eye contact as a sign of aggressiveness or even disrespect. So members of that culture have learned to avoid strong eye contact because that's the expectation and that's what's considered appropriate. By now, I'm hoping that you can see how all of these different elements play an important role in the communication process, but we're not done yet. There's a final element, and it's one that will mess up a good conversation every single time. The final element of the communication process is interference. It's especially important that you're mindful of this particular element because this is what obstructs the message from being received. First, there can be what is called external interference. For example, if you want to have a conversation over dinner, but you're in a really loud restaurant that makes it difficult to talk, you might need to choose a different place or just wait until after dinner to talk. Another example is when people are trying to conduct business over long distances through video teleconferencing, but if the connection is really slow, it can cause the meeting to be cut short or even go sour. Effective communicators pay attention to their surroundings and the possibility of any causes of interference, and they try to avoid them before they become a problem. In addition to external interference, you have to also be mindful of the possibility of internal interference. If a person is worried about a loved one who is very sick or is suffering from pain themselves, that person's ability to pay attention to the conversation is going to be greatly compromised. It's important to be able to recognize when external or internal interference is happening because then as the speaker, you know you will have to either do something to keep that person engaged in the conversation or hold off the conversation for another time or place. And if you're presenting a speech, well, you just have to work harder to make sure that you're more interesting than whatever is distracting the listener. To review, there's the sender who creates a message that the listener has to interpret. In turn, the listener or receiver sends feedback to the original sender who must pay attention to that feedback in order to understand whether or not the message was understood correctly. 
Additionally, the message is sent via three different channels, through visuals like facial expressions and hand gestures, through auditory like tone of voice and pitch, and through technology like texting or even television. Moreover, everything that surrounds us, the physical environment as well as culture, affects the entire process. And lastly, there's noise that can cause interference, either externally or internally. So that's the communication process. Look at all that confusion. So many things can go wrong. It's no wonder we're apt to have so many communication problems. What a mess, right? But now that you have a better understanding of the different elements of the communication process and how those elements affect that process, you are better equipped to ensure that your personal as well as professional conversations move in a positive direction. the beginning of this presentation, I said we'd look at the particular series of actions within the communication process that can lead to effective or ineffective communication. You should have a much better idea now of those actions and how to be mindful of each of those actions and the impact that they can have on the entire communication process. I also asked you to think about what is the goal of communication. Remember, the byproducts of effective communication are the ability to educate or persuade or even to inspire. Those are not the goals. The goal is to actually create a shared meaning. And what that means for you as the speaker is you must remain mindful of the listener at all times and understand how your message might be interpreted. Lastly, the ultimate lesson here is to remember that the message you send may not be the message received. As an effective communicator, it's now your responsibility to ensure that your messages are sent in a way that they are interpreted in the correct way. If you can keep in mind all of the different elements of the communication process discussed during this lesson and also how to apply those elements in order to create a meaningful communication experience, I guarantee you will see some positive results in your personal as well as professional relationships.